Welcome back to Beyond Well Science. I'm Sheila Hamilton, along with Cindy Marty Hadge from Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. We're going to learn more today about hearing voices. Hi, Cindy. So good to hear from you. Oh, it's great to have the opportunity to share. You have been in the mental health system for so many years. I'm wondering if you could just give us a little bit of background about when it was that you were first introduced to psychiatric care. I would say I was in my early 20s, and I had had a, uh, an issue with drugs and alcohol. I got clean and sober and just um, didn't feel like living anymore. And that's how I got my entryway into the mental health system. When you were first uh, diagnosed, what were psychiatrists telling you that they thought you were suffering from? Uh, initial diagnoses were around depression, but pretty quickly... Um, because of my behavior, I, I ended up. I eventually ended up with a, a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. And what people told me was that uh, it was a lifelong uh, illness that I shouldn't work, I shouldn't expect much out of life, and I should be grateful for uh, periods of time when I wasn't in the hospital, but that I should expect to be hospitalized on a regular basis. What did that initial uh, news do to both your spirit for attempting to understand what was going on with your human condition and what you thought about the potential for recovery? Well, it was really mixed because I felt like something was really wrong, and it was great to have somebody validate that, yes, yeah, something was wrong, but what was very unhelpful about it was it was a very hopeless prognosis, and it was more about uh, me waiting to find if they come out with a better psychiatric drug than anything else. Pretty helpless. What were the voices that you were hearing in your 20s? What were they like? Were they menacing? Were they frightening? Um, well, I had had experiences hearing voices and seeing things as a young person, but in my 20s is when it got um, nasty or, or it got really tough. And, yeah, I had, uh, in particular, I had a voice that would tell me to kill myself and, and that that particular voice would repeat the messages that I had received when I, I had been abused as a child. Mm -hmm. So the same kind of things, like, you deserve it, it's your fault, and all that. So do you think that in some ways the voices that you were uh, most attuned to, because they were most frightening, were in some ways asking you to relate to the trauma that you suffered as a child? Oh, absolutely. They were holding, they were holding those emotions, and eventually... You know, and, and I didn't want to look at them. And, you know, that's part of why I had turned to drugs and alcohol. I didn't want to feel, think, or remember what happened to me. And here I was, even if I tried to suppress it, it would come out, you know, through voices and visions. So absolutely, it was, you know, holding a lot of uh, stuff that I needed to process. How was it that you were finally introduced to the hearing voices way of uh, starting to relate to these voices inside your head? Well, I had reached this point again where I was contemplating suicide because the um, the the services I was getting, they were telling me, you know, that I was doing great, but I was so medicated. I was like, I'm Thorazine, and I had no life. And I'm like, if this is the best it's going to be, I'm not interested. Mm. And, but then I remembered how peer support in the form of 12-step had helped me out. So I went online, I put in mental health and peer support, and I was blessed to find out that I lived within walking distance of one of the only hearing voices groups in the entire U.S. Wow. What yeah, was, wow. <laughs> what was it like, Cindy, the first time that you went in there and were surrounded by other people who had had similar paths, similar experience in coping with these voices in their head, and the amount of optimism that's in the room? Uh, well, I just, you know, I didn't know it was possible. I didn't know it was possible to have get this diagnosis and create a life worth living. And here I was meeting, meeting people who were doing that. So, uh, you know, it was just amazing to think that maybe, uh, maybe things could change for me. Since that time, yeah, you've gone on. Uh, you have become a member of the Boston-based welfare rights group, the Coalition for Basic Human Needs. You were a transition from a Head Start parent to a family advocate, and now you're a union organizer. It sounds like you lead quite a fruitful and beneficial life. Those are all the things I've done, and the most important thing that I'm doing now is being a trainer in the Hearing Voices approach and getting to uh, not only share my experience, which gives it value, what I went through, 
But I also learn so much from everybody who attends these trainings. So let's get some perspective for people who have never heard of this before. You're not asking people to dismiss or ignore or pretend that these voices aren't real. So what are you doing? Well, just think about it for a second. When is denial a great strategy? (laughs) If I have a problem, if my car is making a noise and I just say, oh, maybe it will go away or I turn up the radio, you know, that noise just gets louder. And uh, eventually your car breaks down, right? So what we're asking people to do is what, what was asked of me was to turn around and look at my experience, try to understand the context of which these things were happening, how, if you look at the events of my life, might these voices connect to things that have happened to me. Mm-hmm. So instead of running away or denying my experience, to actually embrace it and unpack it. So, Marty, I know that uh, there are some strategies to deal with these voices in terms of how often they want to interrupt, how often they want you to do impulsive and and, uh, and negative things in your life. How do you cope with them? Do you set them on a timer? You tell them you're going to have an appointment with them, or how does it work? Well, so, so for some people that, that works to say, you know, I will give you all my attention, but, you know, I need to get this done right now. Uh, think of... Think of uh, you know, with a, with a young child, sometimes you can tell them, I will help you out with that, but you need to give me five minutes first. And so that is a particular strategy. For me, what really is helpful is to think about what it's saying and then um, get support from other people. Hmm. And say, hey, this is what's happening. And then people who might know me well might be able to ask me questions or put pieces together for me. And eventually, yeah, I guess some perspective on you know, what what is happening, when, where, and what's bringing it on. We have been talking with um, a lot of people from the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care about the increasing number of people who are hearing voices that are on the streets. And, and you said last time something I, I thought was, was very crucial to think about, that homelessness itself and not having shelter actually creates the kind of trauma that increases the intensity of these types of voices. Would you talk about that a little? Absolutely. So if I don't have a place to go, if I'm unwanted, if I'm seen as the problem, those are all these negative messages. And then trying to uh, navigate a world in which, you know, you, you don't belong is very difficult. Another thing that can increase voices is being in isolation. So if you took anybody, you put them in isolation long enough, they will start hearing voices. Mm. I think that's another phenomenon that happens to people who get treated like they're invisible. I, I'm so interested in the success of hearing voices, especially in Europe. Um, what are the challenges of being able to implement uh, this kind of support for people who are hearing voices in the United States? Well, when I initially uh, I was in counseling, I went to a therapist and I said, I want to go to a group. And she said, no, don't go. They'll tell you not to take your meds, and they won't let you go to the hospital when you need to. So that was her fear. And then five years into the process, she's like, can you give me flyers about that group? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think it's fear. You know, people are afraid. Uh, and, and also people do this all-or-nothing thinking. And, you know, there's a big difference between taking Thorazine and taking nothing. Right. And, uh, and people, sometimes when you say, you know, I was so heavily drugged by psych meds that I couldn't even process my past or my present, you know, that's not exactly the same as saying nobody should ever take anything. That's correct. It was just, it was just too much, you know, and not actually helpful in the long run. Yeah, I've heard it said that psych meds would be better used as a screwdriver rather than a sledgehammer. <laughs> right. Um, I've I've really enjoyed talking with you, Cindy, and I, I think there might be someone listening today who maybe has a loved one who has said, I'm hearing voices, and I want you just to leave us by offering any kind of advice or perhaps hope, because there's not much hope at the beginning of this kind of journey. I think that um, to inspire that somebody has many of their answers within them, if they are just given the opportunity and the and the 
interest and the curiosity to actually sit and unpack their stuff and lots of people are defying the odds or, or the prognoses and you don't have to be alone in this. Cindy, thanks again for being with us. Really appreciate your time. Cindy, again, is a trainer for the Hearing Voices Network and works as a peer facilitator for the Western Mass RLC. Great to talk with you, Cindy. Thank you.